Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fumi Adekwaju. I'm the managing partner of Pearl Mutual Consulting, a business advisory firm that works out of Lagos, Nigeria. It's my pleasure to be the chair for this afternoon between 2 and 5. I'll be introducing all the moderators. And without wasting more time, we're going to go to the very first session. The first session is about power, power panel that is surcharging the rise of renewables. And to lead that discussion today is going to be Maxim Bowen. He is the partner Seed Star Africa Ventures. He's a seasoned investor in the African landscape, investing for nearly 15 years in the region across banking, fintech, education, energy, and agriculture. After managing Blue Orchard Finance, um, um, the, the strategy of Blue Orchard Finance for over eight years, he is co-funding, he is a co-funding partner at Seed Stars African Venture, an investment committee member of the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund. Over to you now, Maxim, and your team. Thank you. Uh, that was a long introduction for me. Um, uh, thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, this is actually the first time I moderate, so I'm uh, pretty privileged uh, as, a, as a VC to uh, have the opportunity to um, ask tough questions to uh, some of the uh, energy sector's leading uh, professionals uh, about the state of, of renewable energy um, in Africa today. Uh, so. Uh, we have the pleasure uh, to have with us uh, on stage, and I'm going to start from the far end, uh, Mr. Akinwole Omobriowo, uh, who is um, chairman of the board of director of Genesis Energy, and brings on board uh, over 20 years of, uh, uh, of uh, high quality experience uh, in the sector uh, across renewable energy and uh, conventional energy. Uh, also, Brice Ludonio. Uh, who I just pronounced with the French accent, I hope that's okay, uh, who is uh, MD Managing Director for the Africa 50 Infrastructure Partners, which manages the um, uh, 500 million Infrastructure Acceleration Fund for Africa 50. He was previously MD for Emerging Capital Partners in the region and uh, obviously a, a, a well-known, let's say, household name uh, in the investment uh, space. Um, Mr. Hussein Sifyan is founding partner at Acre Impact Capital. Uh, he'll be here to tell us about uh, some innovative financing for uh, renewable energy, uh, and we look forward to that. And um, Junior Kwebiha, who's head of strategic marketing at en NG Energy Access. So thank you all for joining. Um, I guess maybe just to give a, a couple, um, just so that we all start from the, uh, the same context. Uh, we're talking about renewable energy in Africa. Uh, renewable energy in the in African energy mix is about 9%. So is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. But what we do know is it's, it's very unequal uh, uh, depending on the regions. So in Central Africa and Eastern Africa, that energy mix can be up to 70% uh, renewable energy. So my first question um, actually, two thoughts that come to mind. First of all, is that we don't have any East African or Central African to tell us how they've done it uh, to get so, so, so high of a rate of renewable energy. Um, but uh, more importantly, I'd love to understand, maybe starting with um, Africa 50 and, and Reese, if, if you can tell us a little bit what can uh, an African-led strategy be to tackle the question of renewable energy, developing renewable energy in the region, but taking into account also, I think, the number one priority for a number of these countries, which is actual access to energy uh, and affordable energy. So what is, is there a conflict there? Uh, and if so, how, do, how should we manage it in Africa? Uh, I think as Africa 50, you guys have a prominent you know, role in that. I, I think there's two uh, separate issues. One is to make sure that we, um, we foster the development of renewable energy recognizing that um, certain countries have more, some natural endowment to develop those renewable energy. Uh, if we look at um, uh, the amount of money that is flowing to renewable energy over the past two decades, we are talking about um, 60 billion, and, and uh, uh, two-thirds of that went to, to um, North and South Africa, uh, where, where you see uh, you have the most of the sun exposition. Uh, so. Uh, Obviously, uh, the, the, it's 
north and south Africa, but it's also solar. So there's something that needs to be done for uh, hydro. But obviously, hydro it takes a bit more time to, um, uh, to come to the market linked to the, the, the environmental consideration, but also to the fact that uh, there's a misalignment between uh, the, the life duration of this hydro asset, probably 40, 60 years, and the current uh, terms of the financing that are available, which is probably more like 15 years. So in terms of making it uh, affordable, there's, there's a challenge. So it's difficult to have a sort of uh, uh, uniform strategy for the entire Africa. It still needs to be targeted effort to uh, facilitate where uh, there's some natural uh, endowment, say for solar, where we see a number of programs such as scaling, so, so, scaling scholar, uh, feed-in tariffs that have been uh, successful in different parts of Africa. So this should be pursued and encouraged. All right, thank you. Um, and um, Akinwole, maybe you from, uh, from the actual producer side. Uh, you obviously are uh, on the ground uh, and, uh, and in charge of uh, the production of, of, of energy. You have the consumers facing you as well. Um, so what is your take on uh, the energy mix uh, in the region? Yeah, th thanks so much. Um, Maximin, it's great to see everyone. Um, I, I think that you have to look at it from perspective of the two main problems. You have the availability problem, and then um, you have the uh, access problem. And availability relates to countries or uh, parts of countries where there is ample national grid, as well as last mile uh, power supply, but the production of energy is intermittent. And then you have access problem. Um, uh, hundreds of millions of Africans that have no access whatsoever to the modern form of electricity. It's a very exciting time, in our opinion, uh, because the, the spectrum of solutions that you can deploy, from solar uh, to hydro, whether it's small hydro, micro hydro, big hydro, uh, to waste to energy, to wind, to geothermal, uh, the, of course, very recently to uh, green hydrogen. The opportunities are limitless. The tons of money required to power Africa, according to uh, President and addition of the African Development Bank, on an average of $100 billion a year, out of which less than 3% comes to Africa today. I, I don't see that as bottom empty. It's, it's just a lot of opportunity they can create millions of jobs, uh, raise amazing enterprises, especially in the rural community, because the majority of Africans that we serve uh, live in suburbia. Uh, most cities have availability problems, so there's power, but frankly, we don't get it enough. And so, but some of us have sufficient revenue to have backup uh, independent power supply. So the opportunity that we see in Genesis and for our hydro platform companies and for our solar platform companies is that uh, we see a mix of serving various segments of the market, from the last mile guys in the mini, in the mini grid and micro grids, to the off grid in the CNI space, and as well as to the national grid where it qualifies. So really, really exciting for us. Yeah, thank you, and, and, and thank you also for touching base on, on the critical element of, uh, of transmission in urban grid. Uh, even though it's, it's not the subject for today, it's, it's a critical element of access to energy uh, in, in the region. Um, and you also touched base on, on the uh, a different segmentation, and I think during our, our previous discussion, Brice, you were also talking about uh, the, the importance of having the quality energy, um, uh, especially for industrial needs. Uh, which are definitely not the same as for, for households. So maybe that's something that we can get back to. Um, but first, I, I wanted to uh, give uh, the floor a little bit to uh, Junior to tackle the consumer part. Um, at, uh, obviously, at NG, Energy Access, uh, you are uh, very much focused on the off-grid. Um, and we all know, I think here we're all qualified professionals, we all know the, you know, or, or read about the off-grid sector. I think it's, it's um, uh, really good to have you here on stage to uh, tell us what your view is of the current development, the current status quo, and also what are the trends. Um, 
that are coming up. Uh, we're all interested to hear that from you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just to pick up from where he's left on uh, the segmentation uh, and the evolution of, of especially off-grid. We are seeing that from the last Google report, the second half of last year, we had about 4 million kits sold. And we're seeing a growth in the need for appliances. So you see a lot more TVs getting sold and fans and productive use. So the customer that we are targeting and serving, uh, you know, there, there are two parts of it. One is that there is a segment of the market that is the poorer customer more difficult to reach, further on, uh, is affected by the droughts that everyone is talking about. FX uh, volatility is hitting that particular customer the most because of price. They're very sensitive to price. That is one customer. The other customer is the you and I, that uh, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, um, in my hometown, solar was regarded a, a poor person's product. Today, that has been demystified and everyone, your middle income people are saying, look, I want to get solar for this. So that's why we see the rise of that and looking of new customer segments. So there is, there is growth, there is opportunity, but it also requires for uh, innovativeness. There's a lot of data that is happening in, in that field. As a case, as an example, because these customers are paying for, all their payments are digitized and all their payments are paid either daily or weekly or monthly, the average number of mobile money transactions that an off-grid customer makes is higher than the average of a regular mobile money pair. GSMA released a report that shows actual impact on the telco business because of solar home systems. So if you get two data sets, repayment data from a customer and his usage from a, from a telco, then you're able to provide unique product to these customers. Unfortunately, these customers' wallets are not big and there's a, a huge fight for that uh, share of wallet. So the question still remains, how creative and innovative are we going to be to look outside energy? Energy is going to be the foot in the door. But what else can you wrap around energy? You know, we've, 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 we've taken a very deliberate approach to understand and learn the needs of our customers more. One of the things that we saw in some of our markets is every time it came to a school fees paying season, all their repayments failed and they lost energy. So we bridged that with a short three month school fees loan, which is about $100. But that was an incentive for them to repay better than they can qualify for that. So now we have to offer a holistic offering. It's not just about energy. We have to start asking access to energy for what? If I need the lights on so my children can go to school, when the lights are off, you've taken me back. And it's easy to, to default to original settings. So we, we are taking a very deliberate approach that is an integrated offering, solar home systems and mini grids as well. Uh, there's the element of weak grid. And then we begin to say, what else can we layer on in terms of uh, some of the, the customer needs? From an investment perspective, I think one of the areas that I think investors should look at is to understand that end customer a bit more. I think investors are spending a lot of time and money in, in learning us as the companies, but there needs to be more work done in understanding the customer that we serve. Because, it, it, you know, FX changes, uh, macroeconomic, all of that uh, uh, is very important. So if you don't understand that last mile customer, you always look at the company as not worthy to invest in. I, I won't respond to that last comment because I, I do think that uh, energy companies are responsible for their, uh, their markets, but what, what you bring up is that, uh, rather than the investors, uh, but, but what you do bring up is that um, basically you have to subsidize the cost of uh, rolling out the, the capex, basically. You have to subsidize it. When you're private sector, you subsidize it by piling on new products. Uh, in other markets, it's subsidized by the state or, uh, sorry, by the states. Um, and I think that's also a, a developing trend. Uh, and so Hussein, maybe uh, you have been active in, in some of the recent developments uh, that we've seen in the region in terms of rolling out uh, PPPs uh, that relate to off-grid. Uh, so I think that's a, a very interesting and innovative model uh, that allows to make off-grid a bit more affordable um, and, and widespread. So I, I would love to hear your, your perspective on that. Sure. Thank you, Maxime. Um, so uh, maybe just some background on what we do, because I think it will sort of help paint the picture. So we're a private debt investment manager 
event, investing in essential infrastructure projects across the continent, and renewable power is one of the areas in which we invest. Um, and our strategy is very specific in that we invest alongside export credit agencies. Um, for those in the audience who don't know what export credit agencies are, these are usually government-owned institutions that exist to support exports from their home country into other countries, typically in emerging markets where access to finance is limited. And to give you a sense of scale, that industry supports about $250 billion worth of financing on an annual basis, of which um, you know, roughly between 20 and 30 billion goes into the African continent. Um, and I just looked at the data in preparation for Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, just in preparation for this panel, I looked at the data for renewables um, in 2020. And that industry supported about $4 billion worth of renewable projects across the continent just in 2020. In fact, one of the largest solar developments in sub-Saharan Africa uh, was a project in Angola, which was supported by the Swedish Export Credit Agency, which uh, provided guarantee on 85% of the financing, and the Development Bank of Southern Africa provided the remaining 15% of the financing. So where we specialize is to come in and provide that 15% tranche of financing alongside export credit agencies, which is uh, probably the biggest bottleneck in getting these transactions done. So that's really where we focus. Um, and I think there's a couple of really important points to highlight in terms of the benefits of the involvement of export credit agencies in these deals, um, tenor and price. On tenor, uh, usually what you find is that these agencies, because ultimately they're government owned, can provide you know, usually a two to three year construction period and up to 18 years repayment. And that really obviously helps with the affordability of infrastructure. Um, the other point is pricing. Um, as government owned institutions, they uh, help reduce risks for all the parties involved and pass on some of that credit enhancement to the borrower. And what you typically see, at least in, in transactions where the sovereigns are involved, is a discount relative to commercial financing anywhere between 30 to 40% on an all-in basis. So a very cheap form of financing and also tenors that the private market's not able to, to support. So what we see in our markets so is really two archetypes of transactions. One is, is uh, governments that have a uh, plan as part of the national development plan to provide um, off-grid solar in particular in rural areas. And what they will do is then they will fund, uh, you know, let's say a lot of 120 projects through an ECA structure. Um, and, uh, you know, will then uh, uh, use that to provide access to, to uh, off-grid solar solutions. Um, the other archetype of project is when the national utility is not credit worthy enough to attract uh, funding and there usually the Ministry of Finance will step in either with a guarantee or directly as being the lender and then will help uh, provide support for that particular transaction. So for example, we have a small project in our pipeline in Southern Africa for the development of a small hydro power plant and a solar power plant and uh, the, the utility is not the borrower, it's actually the Ministry of Finance, on behalf of the utility to develop the project. All right, thank you. Um, and now it, it's very interesting, and uh, Akin Woli and, and you, thank you for bringing up the, the critical um, uh, piece, uh, which I think cuts across all themes here at AFSIC, which is uh, we need financing and capital in Africa, period, no matter what, no matter what for. Um, and, uh, and specifically in, in the case of energy, uh, it, it, it's a very um, particular uh, financing need. Um, I guess one segment I'd like to go back to is, is the industrial sector. Um, in, in the perspective of this uh, round table, which is on renewable energy, are renewable energies capable of um, providing, you know, the quality energy that uh, industries need? And I don't know if the, maybe I can, maybe if, if you want to talk a little bit to that. Yes. Um, 
we, we've experienced um, deploying solutions to uh, industrial concerns, factories, um, mining companies, uh, leveraging uh, solar panels and battery. The critical thing around the CNI space is that it's a premium market space. The industry has a sense of cash flow. Part of the cost of production that affects their bottom line is energy. Uh, primarily, why, you, know, you can have solar as a saver. Most national grid, uh, the price point today have gone above, the curve has gone above solar panels only. So mostly we, we found in the countries that we operate in, which is about seven, that the price point for solar PV is cheaper than that of the grid. So for that customer, it becomes energy as a saver. There are other customers uh, that, frankly, it's their, their commercial customers, so they operate typically between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. So you will have schools, uh, you will have certain institutions, shops, that operate within that time frame, um, and just leveraging your solar PV solution with some battery to stabilize the, the irradiation, you, you found out that it's, it's fantastic for those customers. So on a customer by customer basis, you determine the solution is needed. There are customers that require round the clock power. This sort of customers, you will continue to use the transitional gas because the price point for transitional gas versus solar plus battery is much lower in the favor of the gas. Um, and so in that case, whether it's compressed natural gas, micro LNG, uh, LPG fired or pipe gas, et cetera, you, will always, you always need to determine on a, on a customer by customer basis. But yes, renewable as a core, uh, and particularly solar and battery, we found to be a fantastic solution that is competitive, reliable, and sustainable for industries. But you still rely in, in, in the model that you're talking about uh, on the CNI, let's say, industry per industry uh, or project by project basis, right? And, and isn't the elephant in the room that we just want grid energy? Yeah. And easy, accessible grid energy? Sure, uh, Maxine. So if you look at the uh, uh, how countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, even India has been able to develop multiple mini grids and off grid. You find that, that uh, one size cannot fit all. Uh, we have, for example, we, for over 13 years, we produce energy using thermal, distributed to over 74 customers in an industrial zone, but that, which is centralized, and therefore you can afford to centralize your distribution network. And that was within a 6.4 kilometer radius. But in most instances, uh, the CNI customers are dispersed. So I could have, for example, in South Africa, we have a customer in north of Johannesburg that requires 16 megawatts. And he needs it around the clock. You have another customer that is in Western Cape. He needs five megawatts. He needs it just from 7 to 6 p.m. So uh, you would have mini grid solution, regional grid solutions, of grid solutions, and as a power producer, you have to determine what the customer needs and assess how sustainably, competitively, and reliably you can serve that customer. It makes sense, and I think it, it circles back, I'm sorry, it circles back to um, uh, Junior, when we were preparing this, you, you were mentioning that as a strategy uh, at uh, NG as well, you are looking at mini grids as a way to make off-grid also more, uh, more accessible. And I think it's interesting how these things start to, are starting to, year after year, you know, to, to intermingle. Uh, and, and, and hopefully that, that paints the picture for, for the future. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more how mini grids allow uh, a greater access to off-grid? Because it's, it's kind of a paradox. Um, yeah, so the, the mini grid business is, uh, so what we're looking at is an integrated offering because again, um, the cost of setting it up is, the capex is pretty high. So how far out do you go uh, with the grid wire and, and, and the poles and the connection? Number two, can people who are on the outskirts of a village in a rural area actually afford it, the connection fees? Or then you have to get into 
you know, um, financing that or, or some subsidies to do that. So we are going with a mix of both uh, mini grid and solar home systems. Um, and with a very heavy reliance on prioritizing uh, productive use because that is what is going to fuel the growth of the economy in, this, in these areas. So we will offer mini grids uh, a lot around um, within an agreed uh, distance from the grid, but also now begin to deploy our solar home systems on the outskirts. We've, that also takes back to how do you segment your customers. There are some that just need it for two lights. There are some that will aspire to have all these appliances, but the reality of their income is not going to allow them to do it for a couple of years. So you go in there and build. So the solution that we have on the solar home systems allows for, uh, for the upgrades to be done. So there's a very clear path. I'll start with my two, three lights. I'll eventually want a radio, maybe a TV, and, and something else. Then also on the productive use, use those services that are communally you know, possible so that you, you don't have everyone trying to set up their own irrigation system. Uh, so you set up a bigger one that can be shared with you know, multiple farms uh, around, around the location, and then the hammer mill. So build the, 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 develop the community around it, and with that development comes better incomes, and ultimately you'll, you'll, you'll have that. So it's not a one, two year journey. It's going to take a couple of years for that customer to actually realize it. But ultimately, that's what we've done. Um, ab about two weeks ago, we signed with uh, Cross Boundary Nigeria, um, $60 million to build uh, slightly over 100 mini grids in Nigeria. And that's the same approach that we're going to take. It is going to be to build the mini grids, but be able to understand that the other part of it is if someone can't afford it, then it becomes a burden for them. You know, so there's an element of, if you may call it responsible lending uh, to our customers that has to be taken into consideration. And we've done that by having a very deliberate plan in how we segment those customers uh, into uh, your households and your micro, small and medium, get up to what you'll call your heavy power users as well. It's, uh, it's interesting to see the years go by. Um, and, and this year, uh, it, it really seems as though even NG Energy Access uh, who you know you came in uh, with with Phoenix uh, before you came in uh, really with this um, uh, vision of, of providing kind of light touch energy uh, well, well what I'm hearing today is that uh, more and more we're, we're seeing that this is going to be complex this is going to be long we need strong players and and I'm, we're actually very fortunate to have four very strong players uh, on stage uh, today. Um, obviously, NG as a, as a major international corporate, Hussein's work uh, at Acre Capital, uh, working with uh, you know, mainstream international banks to bring their balance sheet into Africa. Um, that's a very, very powerful tool. Uh, Africa 50, I think, is uh, uh, everyone knows uh, and is excited about uh, the work that, that you are uh, doing and the potential of investment uh, in, into the sector. And, and of course, at Genesis Energy, you have been active for, for so long. So I'd actually like to know if, if maybe, uh, unless anyone else has, you know, wants to rebound on anything that was said, uh, then we can maybe open the floor to, to any questions in the room. Yeah, I, I think that before we do that, I mean, the, the, the topic is supercharging the rise of renewables. I just like to reemphasize to everybody that the and, and I re-echo my brother's words, my brother Junior. Uh, maybe he needs to change that name because he's not Junior. He's the most senior here. Uh, it's a, there's, a, there's a huge opportunity out there. And fast solar, you take it as fast power. Uh, in every patch earth that you find on the continent, um, whether you're doing the tiny power, big power, small power, whatever that is, it's extremely rewarding for impact so you sleep well at night, which is important. And it's good for your bank because you're partnering for a product that is the lifeline of everybody. Doesn't matter who you are, rich or poor, everybody needs electricity. And solar is just that thing that is available in the solar panels. Every day the technology gets advanced, it gets more efficient, it gets cheaper, it gets more available. Um, and so the, 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 we, in Genesis we're clear that um, in, in a couple of decades to come, I don't know if that's by 2050, uh, that Africa will get to a point because we have just that resources where it will be powered by nature. Now, it doesn't mean that thermal will disappear. 
because in the end it's net neutral. It's not disappear. We hope, like Norway, that in 100 years, thermal can disappear. It's an aspiration. But the, the practicality of it today is that um, it's a long game. So like my brother Junior said, you gotta be committed. You have to understand that you have to grind. But it's good grind. So if there's still investors that are unsure about stepping into Africa, Africa today is less risk when it comes to renewable. It's more opportunity. But you gotta be ready for hard work. It's not for the get rich quick. But it's for those that want to maintain consistent level of revenues and consistent level of income, but are willing to really partner with the continent and partner with its people. And there's no point investing in anywhere if you don't love it. It's a waste of time because the difficulties that you're going to face will be peculiar to those environments. And if you don't understand those environments, if you don't like the culture, you're going to fail. I don't care how much money you have. So for Africa, it's less about how much money is in your pocket. It is how much common sense in between your ears, right? In terms of where you're going to invest and with whom you're going to partner and the practical solutions that you deploy. Thank you. Um, if I can just add to that, um, before I got into energy, I also worked in the digital financial services space. And we can take a parallel from what happened with financial inclusion. 10, 15 years ago, it was all about access get out there, get phones in people's hands, get people to open mobile money accounts, and that's it. That was everyone. Everyone who was funding was focused on that. 10 years after that, about 2017, everyone begins asking the question, use cases. OK, all these wallets are there, but they're all inactive. Why? Because then the question became access to financial wallets for what? Yeah. If you look at all the fintechs talking about here, it's about specific use cases. The same parallel can be drawn for energy. It is energy, energy, access to energy, access to energy. What we are beginning to see in the results from these reports is that people are beginning to ask that question, access to energy for what? Yeah. I want to have a TV because my kids need to learn. We talk about the financial divide. We are not talking about the energy divide. If I do not have access to information, I cannot make certain decisions. Mm -hmm. If I cannot improve the, if I cannot do something to my, if I'm just buying, growing maize and selling it, I lose a lot more than if I buy maize, mill it, and then sell it. You know, so there are a lot of parallels that we can take from that. And just to add to, to that statement is, there has to be, we have to be innovative. We have, there's no shortcut. In addressing this problem, we have to also allow for innovativeness because Otherwise, we are all going to target these 700 million people who are off-grid, but today, I'm an energy player targeting that customer. You go in, you're targeting the same customer with insurance. Someone else goes in, targets the same customer with food. The other one goes in, and a bank wants But ultimately, we're all crying about the same thing, the cost of reaching that customer. Mm. If I have built the rails into this customer's home, why should everyone else build rails to the same home? It is going to require creativeness and being innovative. So whoever is going to be investing in this sector, in this space, with these customers, targeting that customer, it is inevitable that you have to be innovative. Otherwise, getting inside there, you're going to leave money on the table. So I just really want to call out that dealing with, and that's why I said my, my comment around understanding the end customer was not in investors going in and, and learning so they can do anything about it, but learning so they can see the opportunity that exists and how much they lose by being very narrowly focused on, I'm only going to do things because I'm a financer. Mm. So it's, it's open, open your mind. There's a lot more opportunity yeah. than, than is being, uh, that has been discovered already, if I may say that. And maybe just to add, I think one of the things that is very frustrating is this issue of perception of risk versus real risk in Africa. Um, when we talk about the deals that we get involved in, the default rate over the past 12 years or so has been 0.83% in Africa. If you look at the same number for the US, it's 0.82%. So when I talk to investors and they tell me, well, it's Africa, it's risky, it's, I find it extremely frustrating because even when we're armed with the data, they just cannot get through the mental issue of 
actually this is not as risky a market as you think because there's a lot of work and effort that goes into structuring transactions and making sure that everything is, is really sort of well structured and addressed. I just want to stress the, the need uh, when we're talking um, of large scale renewables because uh, a lot of what we discussed was probably a uh, lot of localized uh, um, renewables. Uh, there need to be more investment in the sort of um, transmission lines to take uh, where that energy is produced to where the market is, be it uh, industrial plant, industrial zones, but also to um, neighboring countries. Because I, as I was saying, certain countries have some natural endowment, mm. uh, rivers uh, uh, that facilitate the, the building of, of dams, but then they need to be sharing this as a market in regional market. And we see a, a bit of that in um, West Africa with the West, West African power pool. We see a, um, a transmission line that goes from uh, Côte d'Ivoire to Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, so exp to export uh, uh, energy from to those markets. So that's really uh, our African country can mutualize this effort to share uh, a cost-competitive renewable energy. That, that is very important because given the cost of, uh, of putting this large-scale uh, renewable facilities, the, 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 the the, pro the product need to be uh, shared across many countries to, to, um, to better absorb the cost. Yeah, thank you. That's, uh, that's actually a, a very good point, is how to put in common the costs uh, in, uh, that, that, you know, of, of developing these projects and making sure that they benefit you know, the, whole, the whole population. Uh, and it doesn't need to be limited to one country. That's a good point. I also wanted to say uh, on the defaults, uh, even in the venture space where uh, it's very common that investors tell us Ooh, early stage plus Africa, that's two risks. Well, actually, uh, we, have, we have twice, uh, we have a, a default rate that's twice times lower than in mature markets in Africa because entrepreneurs are, are, are doing real things that uh, people really need. So it's, um, and, and I think it's the same thing in energy. So yes, yes, we need to continue innovating and uh, businesses need to continue convincing investors um, that it works. Um, maybe, yes, I see a, a couple questions. Uh, I don't know how many we'll be able to, to take, but we can, we can start with the, Mr. Or can you yell? <laughs> Thank you very much for the, uh, for the very insightful uh, conversation. So I'm Tony Tiu, founder and CEO of Renewables in Africa, and we order by promoting the uh, use of renewables across the continent. And uh, just a quick question I wanted to ask. So when I see the title, it says, supercharging the rise of renewables. And also, if I link it back to your question when you were asking about whether renewable is actually good for industries, sometimes for me, I had the impression that the implication is that renewable can't provide base load power which is not factually correct because renewables have been providing power for 60 years. If you look at hydro, right, in countries like uh, definitely Cameroon, where I come from, or we have Kenya, the Uganda, right, definitely. Uganda, for example, they are renewable 95%, basically. And also you add as well uh, uh, geothermal. So it's important to make that difference because sometimes renewable gets a bad press saying that we can't, we can't provide uh, base load, which is completely wrong, just looking at the fact. Now, when I come back to the question for you was, when we're talking about supercharging the rise of renewable, so are we just talking about solar and wind? What can we do to develop other forms of renewables? That's number one. And then, how can we make sure that we can actually fast track local manufacturing that really would develop skills on the ground? That's my question. All right, thank you. I'm going to have to direct it to someone at least. Uh, so, uh, Breeze, do you want to do you want to take that one? I know that you you have a view on on what renewable energy can work where. Um, uh, as I was saying, uh, renewable energy has worked very well in in South and, and, and North Africa, obviously uh, because of some natural endowment, and and the the other technology available are wind, but wind are probably working in the southern part of Africa and a bit in the eastern um, Indo, 
far western part of Africa in, Sen in Senegal. So um, what is left is essentially geothermal. There's quite a bit of geothermal potential in the eastern Africa near um, Djibouti, Ethiopia. Uh, and then again, we, we, we are left with hydro. Hydro, some countries have, have some natural uh, endowment with rivers, with the, say in DR Congo or in Guinea, a lot of water, water there. So again, uh, renewable is just a natural endowment, so you cannot develop where it's not, and where it is available, then obviously you have to have this enabling environment to, to do that, to develop, uh, to put that in the market, recognizing that uh, it takes a bit of time with all the environmental conservation that we have for hydro. We are looking at project in, um, in uh, Madagascar, and it takes a bit of time. Uh, we, we are about to uh, complete uh, a, a dam in Cameroon. Hopefully, it will be in, in service uh, uh, in late 2024. So we, we, we keep working on it, but uh, we have to be realistic about the pace at which you could do other technology besides solar, because essentially solar is really the fastest to be put on, to be, that could be put on service. And, and I think on the second part, or on the first statement, in fact, I think we, we effectively agree, and it was was said on, on the panel uh, by Akinwole, is effectively baseload is achievable uh, with renewable energy. So if it was misunderstood, I think, I think that was something that was, um, that was said. Uh, maybe we have five more minutes for, for an additional question. Hi there. Um, my name is Alex Iruna with Octar Capital. Um, We've spoken a lot about renewable energy, and we all know the temporal nature of renewable energy. Is it possibly too far to imagine that perhaps the biggest component of the future of energy is really storage? Yeah, because there's the, the idea, idea of wind and, and sun, and we know, like you said, it's localized, one, two, it's available when it's available. Nature dicta dictates. Um, with that in mind, how do you think of the backward integration of your companies um, going full circle back into potentially mining? Because um, I'm drawing this parallel because to store, you're going to need the right earth metals uh, to build the batteries, et cetera, et cetera. What is that link for you, if there is one? Yeah. No, I'm fine. Um, I yeah, think I think I can't. <laughs> I think that you're right in terms of backward integration, but everything takes time. So the, the first step, I'm an economist, so there's, there's a degree of, of efficiency in specialization. So you need to first focus on your strength. Uh, for Africa today, I think that we are ground zero. We like to leapfrog very quickly, um, use what we can on thermal, but grow very fast on renewables. Um, so the first step is getting the best technology, the most effective, cheapest, get power to the people. A lot of people hungry, a lot of women going to villages, you know, fetching water, jobless, etc. So empower folks. Step two is you already have a whole lot of local entrepreneurs in a mining enterprise. Uh, then you start to look at around backward integration. But I would say the second step really is to enable uh, battery and storage manufacturers in Europe, in America, in China, India, wherever they are to get located on the continent, create that enabling environment, get it to work. Let's learn from them, let's experience. There's no point starting something that you don't know, you're going to fail. So the notion therefore is partner with these folks, uh, let them come down, create very good enabling environment, let them make money, let's get cheap solar storage. And as day three, as soon as we learn a lot more about it, then we can start doing it ourselves. But that's my point of view. You know, somebody else may want to do it differently. Uh, no, I completely agree with partnerships. I think that there is more than enough on everyone's plate to focus on what they need to be doing. Uh, someone has invested 40, 50, 100 years in mining and doing something else. There is no need for us to start uh, doing it, especially with what lies ahead. So I would definitely agree with him and say, you know, let's, let's get better at what we're doing now. Let's get the right partnerships to, at the table and have those conversations. And if it necessitates with the right partnership, I don't think it would. But if it then, then you get to step three where you begin doing it yourselves. But at this point in time, it's deal with the problem that's in front of us. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. I, I think that's uh, the end of our of our session. Um, thank you all for for coming. We actually have a pretty filled room for a 2 p.m. Uh, uh, second day uh, venue. So so thank you, and thank you for the questions as well. Thank you all for uh, for the insightful comments. And uh, well, we hope to follow up uh, after this. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I didn't need to tell them to clap for you. That means you guys did a wonderful job. Please clap for them once again. Thank you. And um, if I may say, just as a summary of what they've talked about um, today, they've talked about access to finance, customizing the power requirements, collaborative empowerment and innovation, and large-scale renewables. Thank you so much. Interested to know. Yes, it is. But I'll send you. I'll send you. All right. I'll respect you.